AskGunQuestions.com is a website that we built back in 2007. And since then, for the last 15 years, people have been able to ask questions of simple to advanced nature, and we attempt to answer them in different ways over the years. Join us now as we start a new series to answer gun questions. GearWebsites.com is your source for firearms-based playing cards and books. We also have mugs, shirts, and posters with designs that we've made live. Of course, we have patches. Every Friday is Free Patch Friday. We appreciate your support. Thank you for shopping at GearWebsites.com. Mike is not working. Okay, welcome everybody. We're uh, getting started here a little bit late, a little bit... Uh crazy as it can be on a Saturday sometimes. We've got a little tiny co-host here. I was just chatting with Tony and uh, I'm not exactly sure what he's doing but um, he'll be in in a bit. I just decided to get going live some already late and I like normal. I schedule this thing for noon on Saturday for me and I know that's about to change here. And I never, honestly, I can't remember if I changed it. I always, I don't know what it is. I always can't remember if I did this for 10 or for noon. And uh, anyway, we got started here. We're doing Ask Gun Questions. A little bit sloppy. It's a Saturday. But uh, what are we going to do? So uh, what we do, I guess I have this set up since uh, Wednesday's house party. I guess I can change this out. Get rid of that. And there's Tony. Good afternoon. He's muted. Get rid of this guy. Unmute. There you go. I just started. I'm like, hey, you want to get going? And then I'm like, okay, I'm starting. (laughs) So I didn't give Tony any time at all. I was just like, hey, I'm going. (laughs) That was hilarious. I'm like, hey, where's the link? Okay. (laughs) I just figured I was already running late. So I kind of started, tried to salvage the start time since Norm, I've done this like two hours late before. So. There were people in here. I figured I'd start it. So uh, thanks for jumping in. I don't know where you're at. Are you working? Or are you off today? I uh, just got off of work. Been working overtime every day this week. And they had us come in on Saturday. And I'm like, hey, um, got to be out by two, bro. So uh, slid in. And I'm here. <laughs> right on. So we've been chatting about other stuff. You've been on the road. So I figured let's try getting back to the roots of this show and actually talk about some gun questions. I know people have been asking them. So I'm going to bring them up on my screen here. Uh, like it says in the intro that we started doing this back in 2007. So, uh, you know, over the years, there was no internet. There was no streaming live back in 2007. But over the years, we've uh, collected quite a few questions here. And they still come in. Uh, you can go to the website. There's nothing there. There's no ads or anything. It's not a click funnel. I'm not asking for an email address or anything. It's just a place to ask questions so that we have something to talk about on the show. And uh, people have been asking questions, so I figured instead of ignoring them even more because we've been on the road and doing stuff, and then Tony's been on the road, so we've been kind of talking about our adventures uh, on this show. I figured let's get back to asking some questions. So you're good to go? Uh, are you driving? or? Nope, I'm at the house. I got here. Okay, so let's go backwards. Mm-hmm. First one came in yesterday, the other day. Uh, we are making a real model of the TF2 sniper rifle. We're not sure sure how the scope should realistically be attached to the barrels or the supports. There are multiple screws, so it's... What's this saying? No, clicking on the wrong one. There we go. Um, there are multiple screws, so it seems self-explanatory, but there's also a big screw in the back which puzzles us. What's the big screw in the back on the small scope support for, and how could the top scope supports realistically be connected to the bottom scope supports okay i have no idea this is some kind of toy gun you think what is tf2 first off i just tried to google tf2 sniper because i don't know and i got a video game reference oh okay somebody out there might know um so that's interesting i guess that had to happen at some point somebody thinks that uh, ask gun questions is for virtual or video game it just says sniper rifle official tf2 is the default weapon for the sniper what does that mean oh team fortress 
happens. That must yeah. be a video game. Yeah, I have no idea. Do you have any idea on this one? No, because I'm trying to look through it. Uh, video game, video game, in real life, too. This is not a PM2. That's a that's an M14. A Starlight Scope. Yeah, I'm looking at the image side of it now. I guess I wasn't before. And yeah, what is this thing supposed to be? Some goofy looking rifle. So I'm guessing just by looking at it and what you know, minimal knowledge I have of the video games, they have to create an entity and then they give it a skin. The skin is a graphic that is used by the engines to emulate all the different angles that it might show up. You know, when you start emulating an environment in a 3D software or whatever in a video game software. So essentially they create, you know, some points in a, in a system and then they give that some skin and whoever came up with this skin, I'm guessing had no idea what a rifle looks like. Uh, the attachment points on, unless the materials used are way stronger than the materials we have on this planet, uh, there's not enough physical connection between them. I'm looking at the, the rifle here and it's a goofy looking rifle, either meant to interact with the blocky graphics of the skins of the characters or just to give it a unique shape so it's not copyrighted um now i don't know if they're talking about in the game because there's probably upgrades and modifications you can make to things like this you know a rifle in a video game but there's probably also plastic models or something like 3d printed versions or toys or something that are out there and if they're talking about a specific toy or something you know we don't know what they're talking about we're just looking at the internet here and I'm guessing that the questions are, how does this thing even work? Well, it can't work in reality. It's a it's a video game, so it's fake. It's essentially a cartoon. They can draw it however they want. And they drew it in a way to either, ampl I don't know, you're looking at it. It's like either supposed to ex ampl amplify the, the characteristics of the rifle, or like I say, it's so weird looking that it's almost like it's supposed to fit into Mickey Mouse hands or like into animated characters that have little short arms or something. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't see. Um. Yeah. I'm looking at this and I'm like, yo, this is straight up cosplay. But yeah. then I see this guy over here, the firearms expert, Jonathan Ferguson, reacts to Team Fortress Two. Oh, so, video. Uh, yeah, it's a 20-something minute video. Uh, this is John. He, he's uh, I guess England's version of Ashley. Uh, oh. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I've watched this stuff before. Very interesting. Well done. I've not seen this one. I've not seen this one, but obviously he's spoken about it because he has a whole video about Fortress 2 guy. Team Fortress 2. I'm guessing it's a no, no, popular video game just by how many posts there are on it. Yep. He's with the Royal Armories. So you guys have to check it out. Oh, wow. This is funny looking. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just watching the beginning of his video, and he's showing the different firearms. And yeah. Yeah, they're goofy video game firearms that, like you said, avoids copyright. I mean, not copyright strikes. But probably trademark infringement. So they look goofy enough. I mean, they look like real guns that they're basing stuff off of. So if you want to check that out, uh, GameSpot is the name of the channel because I'm not going to watch this thing here. But obviously, he goes into what the real guns are in some kind of way that some of this is based on. So that might give you a better idea or at least a starting point. But I think it's cool. Oh, sorry, I'm sitting here muted. So that was an interesting way to start it off, I guess. Uh, I don't read the questions ahead of time or filter them or anything so even though we can't really answer that one at least we gave some perspective on it and uh yeah go find somebody who knows more about video games i guess i'm sure that those questions are if they're asked by anybody they're asked by others so it's possible that there are people out there that are addressing these i just don't know who to send you to you know who the only person i would send you to uh is either rollo or uh joe right like they're the only people i know that play video games and i think well you know Ro does, uh, Rolando does the uh, video game uh, videos still. Like he does, goes live and plays, so he, he probably has more familiarity with the stuff. 
or maybe uh, Andrew Gottlieb, who did the uh, 2 8 gaming project for a bit. So, you know, that's like saying, oh, I know somebody who likes guns, so they're going to know about your revolver or your flintlock. And I mean, just because they play video games, I'm sure there's other video games out there that they play. Um, we got questions coming in live. I'm going to hold off on those just for a bit since we're just starting the show, but I do appreciate the people dropping in live questions just because of the way we've been doing this and we haven't answered any questions that are coming into the website in a while. I'm going to hit a couple more of those and then we'll hit some of these ones that are coming in live. If you're listening to this in the podcast, as majority of people are doing, uh, welcome. Thanks. Tony's a host of a bunch of podcasts I'll tell you about here in a minute. And uh, we appreciate anybody that thumbs up, likes, uh, comments on those podcast platforms. Here on YouTube, it's nice. The, everybody knows the logarithm, appreciates it, uses that to indicate the, the show is worth recommending. But those podcast platforms, even more so, much more effective or very effective to leave comments and likes and stuff on the podcast platforms. Um, but speaking of that, since we're kind of starting off the show, how many podcasts are you co-hosting now on the regular? <laughs> um. Okay, I thought it was like um, maybe it's five on the not regular. Yeah, I mean, I, I appear semi regularly on a lot of podcasts, which is awesome, and, and thank you. Uh, so, this, I consider this a regular appearance on the podcast, and also the Gun and Gear Review on Firearms Radio Network. I do that every Tuesday. Also, Simon, I mean, 2A4E podcast, which I've been slacking. And, uh, the self defense radio networks uh self defense gun stores sorry i was flubbing that because all the words got confused in my head so those are the ones i'm on on, on a regular basis and uh well, I, I guess Patreon paul quit now. doing his because i kind of thought plate society podcast is a regular ho- I co-host but Polite I, society uh, con- the, especially we were going to launch this year and i was going to be uh, totally a regular on it because you know you, it's easier to know that you have certain people that will show up every time and and that's what i'm willing to do to be on a podcast you know um just just be dependable even though that couldn't tell by the beginning of this year we've been busy um we, we've missed each other uh in and out no i saw that i didn't watch it but paul did like an hour show Last week, a week ago, saying, like, is this the return of the Plate Society? Did you watch that one? Is there any news on that? No, actually, I didn't. Um, right now, Paul told me he'd help me out. Uh, he'd, he'd actually bring me on uh, when we got the 501c3 going just to let, you know, the people that listen to his show know what's going on with us. And, of course, he's definitely volunteered to actually be a part of the 2A4E. Because he drove out to be a part of Rick Ector's event. And he was like, hey, man, if you're having one uh, and we can come out, cool. And if not, you have one this way, we'll come out there, too. So it's really great that people are willing to be a, uh, allow me uh, to host something in the area and they'll take their time out to volunteer for it. So I, I think that's pretty cool. But did Paul come down when you went to Nebraska? Paul didn't. I don't think Paul knew about me coming down to Nebraska, uh, out to Nebraska at that time. Okay, um, and I have no idea how far that is. I mean, the western states are kind of big, so that might be like a three-day trip. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah, I actually, I, I think I might post this. I don't really repost people's stuff to my stories, but I think it's pretty cool that uh, somebody was posting about Europeans talking about how Americans aren't well-traveled, and then he barked oh, I saw out. that. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> That was pretty good. Yeah, did I tag you in it, or did it just come up on? I think it just because somebody I knew watched it, so I guess I knew, or maybe other people. But yeah, go ahead and finish. I interrupted you there, but it was a good post. Oh, so the guy's from England, from the UK, and he said, "Well, I've been here for months, and let me tell you what most Europeans don't know: America is huge." He said, "It's huge." Uh, I think he used the example of Texas. Just driving across Texas would get you through over half of Europe if you drove that length of time in Europe, and that's one state. And and he gave other examples, but I, I think it was pretty cool because I hear it a lot, and I even hear it from Americans 
talking about how we should travel more. And I'm like, why? Not that I have anything against it, but can we calm down and understand that we're not a European country, that we're kind of freaking huge, and we have different cultures? Um, everybody doesn't eat at Applebee's, all right? You know what I mean? Because that's what they try to fall back on when they want to insult us. Oh, what, are you going to go to a chain restaurant? And your boy Marco hooked me up with that. No, you don't go to chain restaurants. You go to local restaurants when you travel. You get local flavor, local recipes, local uh, scenery. Yeah. I mean, exactly. The non-chains or maybe one or two restaurants. What was that? Like a local chain, you know, one that's successful and opens one on the other side of town or something, but not, yeah, not the corporations or the factory restaurants. Yeah, no, that's that's ridiculous. And I'm like, as someone who was born and raised in Virginia and moved to multiple states, each state has its own culture. Hell, Jersey has darn near three, depends on who you ask, three distinct separations in the state alone. North, Central, and South Jersey are real things. Most people wouldn't know that who's from outside the state. But South Jersey identifies with Philly and North Jersey identifies with New York City mostly uh, when it comes to sports teams. And when they say this, well, we're going to the city on Saturday. Well, it depends on where you are, what city they're talking about. It's pretty funny. I didn't know it until I moved here. America is huge. And we really should calm down a little bit beating ourselves up because we're not as well-traveled as Europeans because it's easy to be well-traveled when multiple countries are within 45 minutes to an hour of your home. I think a neat part of that... To to... Go ahead. It takes me longer to get to uh, Newark Airport from where I live now than it takes someone to go from France to Germany. I think a good part of that thing, too, is he was like, they don't have passports because they don't need them. Like, they're traveling. Like you said, we're probably traveling probably more because the United States is bigger. So if you went from Maine to California, you're traveling further than somebody going from whatever his example was, like England to Germany or something. It's like mm -hmm. going from Wisconsin to Indiana. Like, oh, no. But uh, we don't need passports. Like, we don't have to keep track of where we're going. We don't have to get a, a, an authority to say, yes, it's okay, or make sure that the borders are open or... I mean, except for maybe fruits because of bugs and stuff. Uh, there's hardly even any uh, stations, what do you call them, border stations or anything. Like, say, the, and even the fruit ones are were only there back in the 90s, like the last time I saw a fruit inspection station. So uh, either they gave up on them or they quit or something. But, you know, there was, there's never been, you need your papers here. Except, you're, you know, the only time you need them is when you're going across an international border. And since they only know international borders. You know, aside from scale, I thought that was another interesting facet of that one. And I was just going to throw in there that that's why I'm always raging on metric. I don't really care about counting by 10 or not. But the whole philosophy that they're more cultured and better than us because their stupid buildings have been around for a long time. Like, big whoop. Like, our, we got buildings that have been around for a long time, but they can only be as old as the country. You know, we've got mm -hmm. mountains and we've got um, the remnants of the pyramids from the uh, North American original uh, what do you want to say, like people that built the pyramids, if you want to call them native if you want, but they still migrated here from Russia. So, um, and there's all, you know, things changed and we've got a younger country for sure. But like you say, it's not only bigger, but it's just a whole different thing. And if we want to, there's people that live on the, just like in Europe, they won't talk about people that live on the border. Germany and France probably go back and forth all the time, right? And they don't think about it. But that's just like living on the border of Indiana and something, you know, Indiana and Ohio. Like, big whoop if you live in one country. You know, the only time it makes a difference, I suppose, is if there's a time zone difference. And you literally have it, you know, it matters which, which side of the building you're in or which side of the town you're in. But anyway, I thought that was a great yeah. post. We always get yeah, right. I said, I said something because I was talking about this, and it morphed into another conversation about how old the buildings are. And I'm like, stop it. I'm, I'm like, in America, we have historical buildings that you can't change anything on, you know, because it's part of historical society and they're like a 200 year old building. And, and you can't do anything to it without permission from the historical society. Meanwhile, there's somebody staying, their garage is over 200 years old. Yeah. <laughs> it was a carriage sure. house before. 
and that's neat and everything, but you know, and it's not like I love the kind of, I, I don't know I've, if you've seen all these posts that go around, like, here's what stuff used to look like. And it's all ornate stonework, you know, and everything. And then they go, look at what it looks like now. It's all glass blocks. Like if somehow there was a big overseeing authority that said, no, you can't make buildings look like that anymore. In reality, it costs an arm and a leg and like churches or states had to build these giant buildings. You know, they look at something that the state built, you know, the entire resources of an entire state puts together the whatever the Capitol building out of stone. Who else has the resources to build something out of massive stone blocks? Like you can do it if you want, you know, just go get a billion dollars and make a giant building out of blocks. But everybody else wants a building that one doesn't cost another fortune to fix once it's something breaks on it. You know, you chip a rock, you're going to leave it chipped or you're going to go fix that block. Well, now it's going to cost you a billion bucks to get somebody who's skilled to do it where, you know, something like a piece of wood or a piece of metal, the unscrew and replace, you know, anybody can do that. So it's just, it's just the practicality and the efficiency. And, you know, they're going to say that, oh, there's some like reason behind it. Like the aliens built the old stuff and or the aliens built the new stuff. I don't know where they come up with their theories, but, or even they don't even, they just allude to theories, you know, they just go, oh, look at, so I don't know if you've seen that, that, you know, all the old buildings were ornate and our buildings are so ugly. Like, really? Yeah, stop it. It's like, oh, our food is easier. Look how fast our food is. Like, yeah, I kind of want fast food. I don't want to have, you know, not always, I'm not saying fast food, but I kind of want to be able to eat and not have to spend an hour and a half every time I want to eat. Exactly. It's like, look at, stop it, stop it. Go there. What? Go there. Go and try to live in those places that you think is so ornate and awesome. <laughs> and you'll find out how drafty and not energy efficient and how expensive it is and how, Oh, you'll learn a whole lot about how old isn't that great, but it looks good. Oh, me, great it looks point. good according to one metric. Yeah, seriously. I didn't think about the heating in Old Castle or something, and with, you know, with the fireplace. Even if you rebuilt it with internal pipes or something, it would still cost you a fortune to keep a giant a bunch of rock cold or hot. Anyway, we're off topic. Totally off topic. <laughs> um, curious about gun. Curious about the gun I just bought from a reliable store. It's not my first Glock. Wait, it's not my first gun, but first Glock. They said it's a Glock 17 Gen 1 frame, but Gen 3 internals. Just want to make sure it's worth it. Interesting. So that's an interesting question. And sorry we didn't get that one. That one's from earlier this month. Um, oh, go ahead if you want to go in on that one first. I don't know what worth it means. If the thing runs, it's worth it. Um, it's, it's, it's not a, what do you call that? It, it's not a collector's item. I mean, because they use Gen 3 parts and a Gen 1 Glock. It's a pranking Glock, it sounds like. But if it works, it's worth it. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, without a price, you know, is it a worth it for $1,000? No. Is it worth it for 200 Heck yeah. You know, we're sight unseen here. But I think what you said there, you know, like a Gen, a Gen 1 Glock 17 frame is technically worth something. Like, it's possible that it's broken or that it's cracked or it's stress problems or it's been in the uv light for too long you know it is a material made out of plastic so it's nice plastic and everything but it's not going to last forever so, and that is the oldest of them so from 1980 you know how many other pieces of plastic do you have from 1980 and guns aren't just left out like tupperware or you know stuff people laugh about it but hopefully they're not washing it in a dishwasher and getting it up over 200 degrees very often but the material will last if you keep it well, nice and most of the time guns are kept pretty nice it's possible that the holes get kind of expanded over that much time but you mm -hmm. you wouldn't get a new set of pins and everything to fit in there if it was that sloppy so just from the lack of them saying it's all sloppy and it doesn't shoot well i think just what you said somebody had an old gun may m i don't know i'm trying to rem think about how you would have a gen 1 frame with gen 3 internals maybe something broke and it was just easier to buy gen 3 parts or maybe even possible you probably can't buy gen 1 parts except for you know collectibles at this point so like you said it wasn't it was a shooter gun or something so nobody decided to spend three times the price for original internals and they just replaced the internals or maybe they just decided to change the internals they figured you know since the 1980s or whatever if this is an older gun then who knows how long it's been shot let's go ahead and get internals what are internal parts cost Seventy dollars at the most. I mean, yeah. fifty dollars, forty dollars, or depending on which ones we're talking about, they're they're not expensive. Sub one hundred. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you could be talking maybe a twenty-seven dollar part or something, depending on what they're talking about. 
Um, so just want to make sure it's worth it. I think I agree with you hundred percent. There's no way to know, but it sounds like, you know, because, that's uh, what I have is a gen two, because there was, there was only like 20 gen one Glock 19s. So I have a gen two Glock 19, which was the first generation that was so commercial. Uh, really, like I said, there were only 20 Gen 1s, which was, a, you know, the original Glock 17 with the barrel cut down. So it's still run. It has all the original parts. Uh, as far as I know, it was police trade in. So it had lots of rounds through it. It's the original barrel. It's the original everything except front sight. Uh, and I took that off. And, of course, I changed out the rear sight to a, a, a Triclops uh, sight which is really cool. You need to look that up if you want to see something really cool. I really like it. Um, but yeah, it, it works. Uh, I know where the trigger break is. I've fired it and dry fired it thousands of thousands of times. So Glock is a quality hangar. Now, a lot of us bag on it because they're not very innovative as a company. Like everyone else has done Glock stuff to make Glocks cool and glock still hasn't given themselves a high undercut underneath the trigger you know uh glock finally gave itself with the gen 5 a better trigger they gave itself better stippling on the base gun but everybody else has improved upon the glock to the point that lots of companies are building gen, gen 3 glocks better than glock did with more features but they are very solid basic gun and especially if you get a trade in gen two three four five whatever whatever you get uh aim surplus has a lot of them right now and i think they're around what between 350 and sub 200 depending on what caliber you get and which one you get and i think that's really the cheat code if, if this is my opinion only if you're looking for a secondary or tertiary gun or the gun for the relative that comes over after poop hits the fan. That's one way to go pick up a police trade in block. It's easy enough to replace the parts if you're worried about them being beat up, which usually they aren't because they go through the armor before they stay in armor thing. They don't when when police it's not like they buy a new gun and then they throw the others away. What they do is send them to the armory to get checked out and then they store them for X amount of time and then they sell them out of surplus. So the gun has probably been checked out by an armor already and you can have your gunsmith check it out and just leave it with original parts and you'll be good to go. When you start getting cute and start adding other aftermarket things is when you may have a problem with it. And if it's your backup to your backup to your backup, leave it stock. So Aldo is saying, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I agree with you on the police trade-ins. I always like them. They don't shoot them a lot. And like you say, the perishable parts, you know, spring might last 10,000 rounds. And typically they'll either replace it at 8,000 or at 12,000, but they're still replacing it. So um, like you said, they're usually going to put them in some kind of storage and they don't know if they're going to go to the academy or, you know, on some kind of situation, they might need to reuse them. So often they're going to kind of give them a quick look over and, you know, if anything's cracked or broke, they'll replace whatever. They're not necessarily going to replace everything. That might be unrealistic, but they're definitely going to take a look and make sure that they're good to go because rarely do they just stick them in complete storage. But even if they do, you'll get them at a super discount price because they'll have to think of it as the weakest link on the chain. You know, we have to sell these guns as if they're parts only, in which case, even if they are parts only, you're going to get a good deal, but you're going to get any, all of them for the price of parts. Anyhow. Um, Although saying that Gen 1 had issues with plastic, but can be reheated and molded, also fixed with plastic, fixed plastic-wise. I'm not sure of that. I never heard any of that. Mine degraded a bit and sold it. Still was a great shootable gun. I needed the cash. Yeah, it depends, again, on the environment that the plastic lives in. It's just like anything. You know, you leave metal in the... If you leave a 1911 in salt water, guess what? It doesn't exist after a little while, right? Not even all that long. You put 19, you know, a Glock in salt water and the slide will go away. You scrape all that away and you can use it again. So they both have their advantages and disadvantages for sure. But uh, um, I haven't heard of the Gen 1 having uh, 
issues with plastic. I don't know if they've, they probably have changed the plastic over the years, though. I'm trying to oh, think. Yeah, I guess I could compare my old one with, uh, I don't have a brand new one, but I could look at somebody's brand new one or something. But uh, that's not one of the things that I've ever heard them. You know, they do cosmetic changes. They make new calibers and stuff. I've never heard them say, and now we re-engineered the polymer, you know. Like that, I don't think that's, if they have, it's been subtle. Um, let's see. So, yeah, that's a kind of a judgment question that maybe if we had a picture or something. Oh, wait, sometimes people do put pictures up. No, no picture or anything. Oh, you know what? There was a link to that Team Fortress sniper rifle, though. Dang it. So I guess we wasted our time researching it. I could have scrolled over to the right. I zoomed in so I could read it as I'm old. And, uh. I missed that link over there, but they did put a link. Um, let's see. This Somebody's asking what this rifle is and what it may be worth, and they included links to a picture, so I guess I'll try checking that out while we're talking about some of the questions that have been coming up live. So we do this live. I value the inter interactive nature of the Internet, and uh, Tony is, you know, a fan of the live, I assume, too, because he does a bunch of live things. But... Um, we are live here, so uh, I do appreciate the people that are joining us live, taking your time to listen. That's awesome. Uh, we're not really doing too much visually until I show this picture up on the screen here. But uh, also the people that are listening as a podcast. Like I say, I've kind of got that all um, smoothed out. And I used to have all my podcasts go into different, the, you know, the different places that the podcast can go, this or that or the other place. I had them all separate, essentially. And now I shove them all through a place called Podbean. So it just gives me one place to upload to, and then it distributes. And you have to pay for that, so I am paying for that, thanks to our uh, Patreons who make that possible. When I talk about the software it takes to run everything, that's one of those decisions. You know, it's, it's 30 bucks a month. It's not cheap. Look, it was a decision, but it's the time. So instead of, and, and really it's the efficiency, but it's also the, uh, if you miss one of the podcast feeds, then that that whole entire podcast is dead or on hold so it's just for the um um to get all of them consistent i guess because some of them were on from like 2022 even like the, some of them were old feeds or dead feeds and anyway just they seemed uh kind of uh, into shambles so i've been working to fix that and it's just tedious it's not difficult or anything it's, so we are have been noticing a lot more people listening to the podcast. You might have always been there, and uh, now we're just able to see it. But uh, thanks to the people that are joining us after the fact. Uh, I'm sure Tony deals with this all the time. You're on some of the most popular podcasts out there. Um, but we're starting to get feedback and stuff from people, not necessarily just in the, in the YouTube videos. So it's kind of neat, and it's a new experience. Um, so anyway, um, thanks to the people that are joining us live. Although earlier, said to Tony, asked Tony, any suggestions on handling larger and larger caliber handguns, like more recoil, a.k.a. getting used to the recoil? I do 45 and 357 fine, but with my arthritis, it's hard to do bigger stuff. Any tips? Tips. <laughs> All right. Um, no, it's going to hurt. Um, now, there are things you can do. Uh, the grip, you can get the rubberized grips. That helps. Uh, because you still want to shoot full loads just for the entertainment purposes, just for hunting, or like because you can shoot 44 specials. You can shoot 38 to 357 Magnum. Uh, your, what is it? Uh, 454 Casol uh, will shoot 45 Long Colt. So you can downgrade with a lot of these things if you just enjoy shooting your guns. But if you are hunting with them, if you are competing with them, um, you can, you know, shoot the lighter loads again because most people don't compete, definitely don't compete with uh, hot loads for the most part unless they're doing, what was that old school thing where you knock the targets down with the 357 Magnums? Um, steel. A steel challenge? Not a steel challenge. They had a steel silhouette. Silhouette oh. shooting. You shoot those steel animal shapes. That was something from way back in the day. Well, they um, still have that. That's still a thing. Okay. 
So that you're just gonna have to get used to and it sucks. Because getting older is what it is. <laughs> what about one of the things for like bowling? The back in the day the people would bowl would have these like pin? wrist Magic. things on. No, no, they have like a wrist thing on that had like a piece of metal in it. And I think it held their hand in a position or maybe it was to help with wrist strength or I don't know if it was an injury thing, but I'm wondering if you could get like a, like a, more than a glove, like a glove that was thick leather that you could strap on so that it gave you support, you know, like you'd, like you'd yes. snap your ankles yeah. up if you were running. Search for it because they're, uh, again, because I'm old <laughs> and we grew up. Yes, when people shot heavier duty guns. I still remember when a 454 console showed up in an article for American Survivor Mag Survivorless Magazine. Uh, they had a heavy duty leather shooting glove plus uh, the rubber grip. Actually, no, they didn't have the rubberized grip. He still had that wooden grip and they talked about how the gun rolls in your hand like a classic six shooter. And you want this for hunting, so yes, you, you're just going to have to get used to it. It's not like you lay a lot of rounds down when hunting outside of zero and knowing where your impact is. I think a lot of the other stuff you could do, and this is from my ignorance, but dry fire with your revolver, you can do that a lot more to get that trigger pulled down. But lighter calibers, lighter rounds. Because you don't have to fire the full load hunting round to practice, right? This is again, I'm ignorant of some of this stuff. But you don't have to. You don't have to fire the full house load when you practice every time. I figure that's something you do right before you go out, because everything else could be dry fire, lighter loads, which means less recoil, and then for the hunt before you go out you want to know exactly where this thing hits at the distance you're usually going to hunt and that's it you don't have to beat yourself up continually with heavier loads now personally oh and again i think you already said it though and a heavier firearm i mean unless you're you know spotting and stalking because I was looking at a 44 just because I'm a gun nerd. And Taurus has one of their 44 Raging Hunter something. But it's a very, very, very lightweight 44 revolver. And I spoke to the guy at Taurus, at the Taurus booth doing one of the shows. I think it was the Great American Outdoor Show. And I said, what is shooting a 44 Magnum that weighs this little? What is that like? And he was like, torture. He was one of yeah. the testers for it. He was like, it's torture. I was like, well, what if you load 44 special? It's torture. He's Smith like, makes an airweight giant gun. I forget. I think it's the K-frame or something. No, I don't know what it is anymore, but I remember shooting that thing, and it was... You, you know, you talk about catching a baseball bat. It was like catching us something sticking out of a vehicle. Like it was just, it was a lot of recoil. Yeah, the Smith makes, uh, because Yankee actually had it on, I was talking about. What, is it snub nose you're talking about? Uh, I was just at a range one time. I used to do the, you know, I used to volunteer at a range. So I shot a lot of guns those days just because people would be like, hey, you want to shoot it? And be like, heck yeah, I'm going to shoot it. <laughs> um, and, you know, just seeing a giant 44 because it didn't weigh nothing. You know, it weighed like uh, mm -hmm. nothing for the size of the gun it was, but it wasn't the full size, dirty, hairy size or nothing. But it was, you know, it was a 44, and they don't make them in J frames, they make them in, I don't know, it's JK, whatever that size is. It's a little bit smaller than the big ones, but it was bigger than a J frame. And it was, anyway, yeah. Yeah. But, but that was for somebody wanting frame. to carry around a 44 all the time. So you don't want to carry this huge piece of metal, I guess. You know you're only going to shoot it in defense or what? Smith made a lightweight, I think it's called a Night Guard series. Uh, titanium and Scandium revolvers that were in 44. And pretty much made for carrying. And, uh, oh, wow. The, those were really lightweight and I wanted one. But in real life, it would kick your butt.
Yeah, I think uh, Yankee had on his uh, 340 PD, which is a 357 Magnum that weighs 11.8 ounces. That's going to hurt. With full house 357 loads, but you load 38, it's probably still going to remind you it's there. Back in the old days, you would put something on your grip and then just hold it and then sh shoulder that. So it's not attached to the gun, but it allows you to shoulder a pistol. I don't know if that's legal right now, but uh, I think it is. You know, if it's just a thing that you hold, you put it up on your shoulder, you hold it in your hand, you put your gun in your hand. So your grip strength holds the two things together, but no, no attachment points other than that. Have you seen these? Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, especially for revolvers where you don't normally have like any kind of attachment point anyway. I'm assuming those are still, but here's the number one tip. Let's get rid of the NFA already because fuck it. And one of the things that it does is uh, discriminates against people that have any kind of issue, any kind of mobility issue, any kind of strength issue, any kind of dexterity issue, uh, or just people that want to do something with their other hand or just fucking for the, you know, because any reason they want, right? You don't have to have justification to want to be able to shoulder a, a pistol. So I was going to say one option would be, it would be nice to just get rid of the NFA, but an option would be to, you know, comply with the bullshit restrictions of the NFA right now and shoulder, you know, or at least find out a way to get another anchor point so that you can sh shoot the full caliber stuff and not take all the abuse in your wrist. Yeah, it really sucks because uh, I love shooting. And a <laughs> friend of mine, she had a model 60 357, I think it was 60 or 66, which is, I have the L frame, which is a bigger 357 Magnum, bigger frame 357 Magnum. I have fun shooting it. It has a wraparound rubber Smith and Wesson, you know, the original grips. So I load 38s in it and introduce people to shooting with it. It's a pussycat. Well, and I love Ree. She was like, that's great. Nice 38s, sissy. Hey, you want to shoot a real gun? And she prints out this Model 60, which is the smaller frame. I think it's five shots, four-inch barrel on hers. And she loaded it with 357 Magnums. A small girl, small woman. And she handles that thing like a champ. One of the reasons I love her. Man, I shot that thing. I looked at her like she personally hurt me. I was like, nope, we're done here. And I gave it back to her. She laughed at me. And it's still funny to me because she's the bomb. And I'm a wuss. But uh, if I'm going to shoot something, I'm going to do as big a gun as I can. Uh, the L frame, great for 357 Magnum. You know, that kind of brings up something that made me think of something that, you know, all these people that are really good pistol shooters, or at least back in the day, or maybe now, I don't know. I don't really keep up. Uh oh, my break now. Um, because you have the BFR, it, you said you weren't really keeping up. I don't, I don't know what, what you're talking about. What caliber? Hello? I don't know if I'm breaking up. I think I dropped yeah, out. You, you're fading in and out. Okay. I was just going to so say there's also probably on the exercises. Calibre, you can do a lot of crossover stuff. You can do a lot of crossover with smaller calibers. So with the BFR for Magnum Research, yeah, you did drop out. You, you can. Yeah, because we're talking a Smith 460. It's an X frame. You don't have to get the biggest one. Cool through that. Or again, 45 long coat loaded hot. But now you got a beefy, beefy gun that's going to take up some of that recoil because physics is physics. And it's still a good hunting cartridge with the right load. So that's what I like about it. Plus, I only got in a handgun hunting as. Um, a mental experiment. It was one of those, I stumbled across someone's book on handgun hunting and immediately romanticized it, how cool it is in my head. 
and I'm looking at this guy taking out uh, mountain goats. He went on a once in a lifetime hunt with uh, Thompson Center, Thompson Center pistol, which if you know anything about those, Thompson Center can have anything from 22 long rifles to 375 H and H. Like it, it can load anything into it. But it was really a cool book, especially for me, because I used to go to the library as a kid and read anything. And I think that was one of the books I tripped upon at that time. So am I still on? You're still on. I'm having a bad time. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, again, the reason I don't have a picture up for me is because I'm using <laughs> my Chromebook that I just received within the last month. And I haven't set it up for uh, to have my picture in it. I guess I can. But I'm trying to keep up with the uh, chat at the same time. And Am I working now? Yep, you're working now. So I was trying to say before, I wonder if the when you were saying something earlier, and it's I was catching bits and pieces, so it's probably a while ago now in the conversation. But uh, I was thinking of, you know, every once in a while there's a great pistol person or a great a person that shoots pistols well. How often do people look at their occupation or their hobbies? You know, if, they're, if their occupation requires them to have massive forearms or massive arms in general, or if their hobby is like cutting wood or something, like, you know, if they've got massive forearms, that might explain why they're able to control something like a 9 millimeter, like a squirt gun, you know? And then same thing with people that like big calibers. I don't know if there's ever been any, like, thought put into doing wrist exercises and arm strength type of stuff, because half of it is the gun, the other half of it is us, right? So if we can manhandle yeah. that thing compared to, uh, what is it? Is Lily wrist on a, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> I don't know if that's the way you even say it. Is that what it's called? I'll look if that's, uh, am I allowed to say that? I don't know where that comes from. What, limp wristin? Well, limp wristin, I don't think they're supposed to say, but Lily wristin? You ever heard of that one? Nah. Oh, okay. That might be a local thing, because I'm not even finding it on the internet. All right, well, so, um, yeah, sorry about the interruption there. It's the internet. What can you do? Um, Aldo asked a follow or another question. If you could have three dream guns that you can't afford but want, what is your top three picks for each, chat included? Three dream guns that you can't afford but want. That's actually interesting because if it was three wishes, then you wish for three more wishes and you just keep doing that every third wish and you never end. But with just three, you do have to pick three. I usually put a PKM in there. I like them, and I'm not going to pay for one. Um, if it's a specific gun, I'm going to try to think of something like the first or, a, you know, the original or a first run of something. But right now, I don't, can't think of anything that... You know, like the first AK or something. I don't know if I'd want the first one, but like maybe one of the first runs AKs or something. Or maybe yeah, so not the first AK, but maybe some specific one that I, if I thought about it, I like, and then get one of those first runs. So it's all in great shape. It'd be kind of fun. You there? Uh, Tony this, Zane, all right, here we go. Oh, okay. Uh, I was wondering if I was okay. I was like, am I, am I lagging again? And Tony's talking, or should I shut up? Like, I don't know. If it's, it's <laughs> yeah, I'm hitting this damn unmute button, and it's not unmute. Um, yeah, I was thinking about it because it's like you could have three dream guns that you couldn't afford, you can't afford, but want. One, I look at everything as something I can't afford, so let's get that out of there. Um, <laughs> just everything is like, can I get it for free somehow? But when I was really thinking about it, now this has just popped up. I, I haven't thought about it. About it. But it's like, well, I like Woods' choices. Actually, I have a 
1917 infield, which is really cool. I would want one of the million dollar Lugers, which is one of the test trial guns that Luger brought into the country in 1910 and 45 ACP uh, when the American military was testing for their 19, what turned out to be the M1911. Well, Luger sent over 45, uh, 45 ACP Luger. I thought that was cool. And, huh. I mean, if we're talking about a dream gun, yeah, yeah. But again, this is a dream gun. And I'd freaking shoot it. I don't care. <laughs> At least shoot it once. Um, that's one of them. Another? Now, we're just pulling stuff up, right? We're just saying different things. I would like an uh, a Colt monitor, which is Colt's version of a BAR post World War Two, excuse me, post World War One, but pre World War Two. So I think it had like a twenty inch or eighteen inch barrel on it, full auto, thirty odd six pistol grip instead of the uh, old school. I mean, instead of the Monte Carlo stock, it actually had a pistol grip. And I think that's one of the cooler guns from the end of war periods that, of course, I could never afford or have because of NFA and life. So that's two. Uh, I'll, I'll figure out a third one. I decided to eat a handful of peanuts and then I left you hanging. So, um, Woods had said the Medusa revolver, and that made me think of, not the Medusa, but the Medusa is the one that can hold multiple calibers because of the cylinder has a little yes. dealy in it that lets it uh, head space off of this little dealy and not the rim. Uh, so it can shoot a lot of different auto calibers that are 30 caliber, essentially. But um, with another really expensive... I first saw oh, that. Oh, go ahead. I first saw that on your YouTube channel. Yeah, I think I was one of the first to do like a here's what it looks like type of thing. Everybody else was like, look what I got, and they shot it because one guy had two of them, and he'd shoot them all the time because he just owned them. But, uh, you know, I was more like, here's, let's take a look at it. Um, but uh, there's another expensive ass revolver that's from World War II. It's a Webley, I think, that is a semi-auto revolver. You've seen that one? They're super expensive. I've only ever seen a couple, but there was a gun show where a guy let me fiddle with his, so... Um, I've fiddled with one before. Uh, they're pretty neat. And essentially they got like a zigzag shape on the outside of the cylinder. So as it shoots, the recoil makes the cylinder go around. Right. And that's where I was getting back to what we were talking about before with recoil and how come there's no development in revolvers? How can there be a Medusa? How can there be a Webley semi-auto revolver? And how come we don't have them in 2024? We can make a billion in incarnations of the Glock. Oh, I hate the Glock so much. Here's a cl clone of it. Oh, I hate the Glock so much. Here's the exact clone of it, except minus one part. <laughs> I hate the Glock so much, so I'm going to put it to the spec of the Glock, right? Like, there's a million versions of Glock, and there are a million versions of AR. You know, it's not like there's only those, and then a million versions of SIG and Beretta, whatever you want to pick on. But how come we don't have a semi-auto revolver? How come anybody doesn't have the cojones to build something that's reliable, yet more... Uh, what's the word like ergonomic? Is that the right word for reducing recoil? But you know, like more cap, more able to be shot by more people at a higher caliber. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. It was the Matebo. That right. was the semi-automatic revolver. No, the Italian semi-automatic revolver. I got to develop that. If my memory serves, since that's all I'm going on. Also was on the development of the Chiapa Rhino. He helped develop that. Will other manufacturer speed loaders work with it? I mean, I just imagine so. I think it only took a, was it a Smith & Wesson or a Ruger? I think it was a Smith & I don't remember. It took a brand cylinder and all they did is add, you know, they added to it. So they just took the spec of somebody's revolver. I think it looked like a Smith & Wesson, didn't it? It wasn't a Ruger. I would have liked it less if it was like a Ruger, probably. So, um, yeah, Rugers didn't really look good. But, but I think, uh, any speed loader that works with that gun, you know, that revolver would work with it. So, 
Um, now it might not work with every caliber because there's some calibers that the speed loaders, you know, connect to the rim. And if it's an auto caliber, it might not work with the speed loader. Um, moon clips, I don't think would necessarily, I'm not going to say those are going to work with it because, well, moon clips just don't work with every revolver. I just don't know if there's enough room in there for it. I don't remember. I only got to play with it that couple of times years ago. Uh, the, what is this? I don't know how to say that. Menhuren MR-73? Mm -hmm. Is that a Europe gun? Is that a Europe gun? Yeah, the Menhuren. That's the French gun that uh, French uh, anti-terrorism units use. 357 Magnum. Very, very accurate. Built to take full 357 loads into the tens of thousands of rounds. Oh, okay. Um, who brought it? They, they, they are now back on the American market. And I think Beretta is kind of responsible for bringing them in. Because since Korth is coming into the country with Nighthawk Custom, and they see there's a market for that, I think they went and got them, uh, Beretta went and worked with them to get them into the country. Because they're very expensive. They're overbuilt. But they look sleek. And they're used by the GIGN. And they were used in a few incidences where, a few incidents, uh, that a famous CNZN uh, rescue, hostage rescue operations. I think one of the cooler ones, I think it has like a 12 inch barrel and a freaking bipod and a, and, a, and a magnified optic because they use it as a sniper's pistol with again, full load 357 rounds. Aldo Sand found that magazine. Wait, found out that magazine for my Tactical Solutions 2011 uh, situation that they will make the mags, uh, that they're billet CNC machine one piece magazines, but do not list them online. You have to contact them. Wow, I can't imagine making a machined magazine. How much does that cost? And that means they got to mill out all that, in, or maybe it's just a big hole they drill. Even then, it's a lot of material to make a magazine. That's to give it the rigidity, I guess. I don't know, sir. Wow. Um, but then again, Tactical Solutions is a machine shop, so they're not looking for how to bend the metal. <laughs> they're looking for how to use their mills, right? <laughs> True. Like, they're not like, hey, let's look at a plastic solution to this. They're looking at like, you know, we can make this happen. Yeah, if you're looking for uh, ideas on how to paint your house, you don't go to someone who sells aluminum sign. <laughs> I saw it's a just... thing on Instagram where there's somehow uh, electric lines fell onto a house in the rain and then it hit the aluminum siding and was like creating current, you know, all the way through the wall of the house, like arcing all the way on the out. Like, it was super cool. Cool looking. It had to be horrible for people to live there. I didn't even know that was a thing. Holy crap. No, I didn't I mean, either, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It's metal. Like, I've lived in houses with aluminum siding before. Now I'm trying to remember anymore. I don't think it was in a place. Wait, well, there was lines in the air, but I think they were just phone lines. I don't remember anymore. It was a long time ago. But yeah, I had, I've never seen that before. I imagine fire departments have to deal with that kind of garbage, but crazy. Anyway, it's getting on that. Uh, it was, somebody was asking what it was like down here, and it's been raining the last couple of days, so I think we're dealing, I hope we're dealing with the end of the rain for a while, because we got blue skies, but sometimes blue skies at noon is thunderstorms at 6 p.m., you know, you never know. But uh, plain note is saying that you're getting the rain, you're getting rain up there? Yep, for two days, three days in a row now. It's and they're really asking the weather there. I mean, it's super green, and you're next to the ocean, so I assume you get rain all the time. But do you? Mm -mm. We don't. I mean, but right now, I mean, they said it was supposed to be snow. I don't really follow the weather because it is what it is. Unless I'm doing something outside, or yeah, like exactly. Prior to host university shoots, I just check it real quick to see if people are going to be late or if traffic's going to be stupid. Outside of that, I don't care. It's weather. Uh -huh. I, I no longer farm, so it makes no difference. 
And when you farm, it still doesn't make any difference. You still have to do everything outside, whether it's in the rain or not. Yeah, you react as much as you can, and you try to pre pre preemptively react, essentially, or get yourself ready to react. Um. So yeah, uh, but the thing is with this knee, because it's bone on bone, what I'm dealing with right now, I got some injections. And I, w I couldn't figure out why my leg was hurting more than usual. And somebody was like, rain. Hurts more in the rain. I'm like, great. <laughs> great. One more reason I need to move to Phoenix, right? I don't know about that. Hey, I went, did you, have you been to San Diego? No, I've heard San Diego is like, has some of the greatest weather. I don't know. Every time, well, I guess I went there this time. The first time I went to San Diego, I uh, drove across the desert there and from Arizona, and my dog got heat stroke. So I was all worried about the dog. Um, and the van was running poorly. So I was completely distracted the first time I drove through there. I went over there for Gun Owners Radio or uh, San Diego Gun Owners Gun Show last weekend. Yep. Holy crap, is San Diego fun? Like uh, the gun show is a California gun show, but it, you know, regular gun shows it's not a giant gun show so they were able to attend it and still have a chunk of the day and the way we drove over there overnight i needed to go take a nap or whatever anyway so you know we left the gun show let's say at noon or something and then drive around looking for something to eat at the hotel and all that you know you get to see a bit of san diego it's just a lot of fun i really like that place so are you going are you planning on a gun rights policy conference going to it they've asked me to go to the gun prom a couple Oh, that gun prom is also an excuse to go there. I didn't think about that. So yeah, I'm looking for excuses to go there now because it's it was pretty fun just to go in there and driving around. Yeah, I mean, I got to check it out because once we start raising funds, you know, the, the things have to pay for themselves. They have to make sense. Then it's oh, just sure. tied into hosting events. It's great to go to things to meet like-minded people and people in the fight. It's really awesome. But it has to be more than just me going to visit. Um, because, you know, uh, like anybody else in what we do, you're taking time away from your family. But I'm also spending funds that people donate for the cause. And if I'm just doing some vanity project, because it's great to see these people, it's like, no, oh, let's dude. tie this in with diversity suit. Seriously, even driving there something. was 500 bucks. Like, it definitely doesn't pay for it. Like, it's not inexpensive. I can't imagine what the flights would be there. And then you'd have to rent a hotel and everything also. But it's an interesting town and it's fun to drive around in. And, uh, yeah, I'm told that the rain that we experienced was unusual. But the cool thing was something like that's far enough out that I can book it early. You can use some of the sales on things like Spirit Frontier, Spirit Frontier, whatever, and catch a good deal if you do it far enough out. Like right now, I'm looking to fly down to see my wife, and if I planned it out enough, it's a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars round trip on Spirit. I'm like, okay, cool, bye. <laughs> you know. It's like that. That's pretty good. I mean, heck, I spent more than that in a week in Ubers in Vegas. I'm going nuts over here, by the way. I uh, stopped and got my wife. I like to get my wife um, different snacks from different countries and things like that. I think it's really cool to send to her, especially if they're good. And I stopped at a Filipino uh, restaurant and I picked up some golden sweet corn corn puffs well i bought two bags and uh hey look surprisingly one of them didn't fit in the box so i had to keep it, eat it myself <laughs> well sometimes if you let the air out then it'll fold up but you got to open it to let the air out. oh no i wasn't gonna let the air out until i opened it <laughs> so what's a regular did it taste different or something or is it yeah um here, i suppose it tastes it really crisp, as you can hear. Um, and um, what's the thing? Not corn puffs. You know how corn puff cereal is really sweet? If you've had it back in the day. Uh, this is not that sweet, but it's the same texture. 
and it really tastes like corn. Not just a sugary snack. It's not very sugary. Oh, but- I'm thinking of Cheetos, uh, cheese puffs, I guess. I was You're talking yeah. cereal. Okay, okay. Cereal. Okay. It, it's like, it's the shape, of course, it's a round puff. But uh, it's a little bit sweet, but not very, very sweet. It's a pretty cool snack food because other countries don't have such a sweet tooth as we do when I notice the candies because it's I'd have Japanese candies. I've had candies from other countries, and they're not as sweet as American candy. But this, you know, again, it's not a candy. It's just puffed corn, sweet corn. But uh, it, it tastes really good. And I'm starving because we uh, got started this morning at work at 7. And uh, worked all day with the inmates. <laughs> so I had... I had uh, lunch in prison around 10.30 this morning, which was uh, prison chili. I, I don't know what grade B meat is, but I'm I'm pretty sure grade D meat is what they put in this chili. But it's still a little bit tasty for what it is and where we ate. It's so, you know, like that cafeteria that. food, I suppose. Probably too salty. It, it's like cafeteria food, uh, a step down from cafeteria food. Like school cafeteria food, yeah. Yes. Which, hey, it is what it is. The cost was zero. Haha, <laughs> Japanese candy. So I sent my wife some of that, uh, maybe two weeks ago. Some Japanese candies, but they also had some savory snacks, and a couple of them were fish flavored. My wife was like, "Who, who would do this?" Who would so, do this? Can't, like sweet, but fish or savory, like. Like a beef jerky, it was but savory. Fish. I think, I think it was savory. Now, the last time I purchased Japanese snacks for myself, I was in Japan. So, and you know, I'm, I, I mean, I'm just not even going to say. It. Yeah, I'm ignorant of when it's written in kanji what it is. So I didn't recognize any of the things, but I just tried stuff when I was there. And what I went was on uh, Amazon, and I saw a pack of various snacks that you could send to somebody and I spent like 40 bucks on it and sent it to her. And uh, she was like, yeah, anything that tastes like fish I threw away. So I think she threw two or three of them away because she's not into fish, neither am I. And it really didn't specify what they were. It just said Japanese snacks. Now, I used to hang out in the bars in Japan. I didn't drink, but I'd hang out in the bar and they had bar snacks in Japan. And they would be things like, you know, seaweed. Um, and I just thought they were good, but I don't remember. And anything fishy, I just really didn't eat. I just don't like the taste of fish for the most part. And neither does my wife, so that works out. Yeah, I can handle, like, the fried fish. You know, like, a mm-hmm. piece of fish fried when it's, like, 50% batter or whatever, and then some fish in there holding it together. But uh, you know, when you start mm-hmm. getting into the sardines and stuff, nope. Like, I grew up eating salmon cakes and mackerel cakes. I can see that, I guess. Yeah, well, um, I ate it because we didn't have a choice growing up. It wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Mom, like I don't tuna, like this. Like some, tuna casserole for me. Like, you know, I only had to eat that because I didn't have a choice. Like, go, go hungry, eat that. Yep. Yeah, it's not like mom was. <laughs> I don't know what kids do today. I've I've seen my friends make their kids what they like. Oh, everyone else is having this. Yeah, that was in my house. This, I mean, we might have been once in a while. What do you want to eat for dinner? And then you might say something like pizza. I'm like, no, we're having this. Like, okay. Or the once in a while, it's like pizza. <laughs> and then you'd be like, okay, we'll have pizza. But back in the day, it was like, all right, let me make some pizza dough, smear some sauce on there, and then there's a pizza. But it wasn't like, let's order a pizza or nothing. Oh, later. no, 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 no. We didn't even have anywhere to order a pizza until my last years. No, I don't even know if we had a... We had a pizza place in town, but it was not a Domino's or Papa John's. It was, you know, I think the name of the company was... Yeah, some guy, some family making pizza, right? Probably made mm-hmm. other stuff. And yeah, made pizza. And since we live so far out of town, you'd have to order it and drive in. Of course, by the time you get there, the pizza's been sitting out for 10 minutes. Now you got to drive half hour in the car (laughs) to get your cold ass pizza home. 
So to us, we would purchase the supermarket pizza because the supermarket would have their own pizza in the back that they pre-make, and all you had to do was throw it in the oven. And that's that's what I grew up with when we had pizza. No, we it was uh, flour and whatever mixed together, make a dough. Then while that's sitting there, you get the other stuff chopped up and you squish it out and spew stuff on there and then throw it in the oven. It wasn't bad or nothing, but it was not, you know, it wasn't, uh, well, it wasn't bad. I'm not complaining. It just wasn't like, I'm used to Chicago pizza. So for us, it wasn't a real pizza because it wasn't a Chicago pizza, but nobody in the right mind is going to try to make a Chicago pizza. Okay. Well, we're getting off on food topics here. Um, although pizza is a valid gun topic i think um i don't think i'm into my diversity shoots <laughs> so why don't you talk about that for a bit um when's the next one what's happening with them right now um actually this weekend is when i'm going to put the pressure on myself to pick the rest of the dates for the other two ranges that i'm working with and initiate my contact with two more ranges that i'm attempting to work with this year uh so my next event the guns for higher range, I think it's like on the 11th of April or something like that, but I'll be posting. It's too far away for me to post. Um, but yes, that's what we're doing. Uh, I also need to have diversityshoot.com updated with the new schedule and throw on some new picks. But again, that's something that we can work on. Hopefully they don't demand that I do mandatory overtime this week like they did all of last week. So Diversity Shoots is introducing people in New Jersey and other states, but this year, right now, is scheduled in New Jersey, two firearms, the Second Amendment, um, Second Amendment advocacy groups, and teaching them how to be responsible armed citizens. We, my volunteers, introduce people to guns in the ports, and you run multiple guns per port. Where we have pizza there, we have raffle prizes that were donated by various companies, that which raises the money to pay for the pizzas and we have a lot of fun trying to bring people together and create relationships with people that may look different on the outside may come from different backgrounds but we all believe in the ability to arm yourself to protect the ones you love or just to exercise your right or we just happen to be in the same building at the same time. And I like to point out to people that pretty much in America, we have 98% of everything in common. And there are powers out there that want us to only concentrate on that 2% difference because it's profitable for them to keep us divided. So I, I just try to build a fellowship of people at my diversity shoots. And it's been working out since 2015. So we're on year nine. Uh, we take donations. We have a Patreon uh, that I finally got everything together on, so that's great. We also have PayPal. You can contact us using diversityshoot.com, and you can donate any way. Somebody actually donated twenty dollars a day, so I really appreciate it. And that's what Diversity Shoot does. It just it, it's hilarious. If you follow me on Instagram, Simon says train. You will see such a group of people that. I don't think you could put it together at a photo shoot because you couldn't figure out what to ask for. We have older black ladies, white ladies, um, LGBTQs represented. Uh, almost every religion is represented, and that's just one event. And I you think had uh, both old people and young people that way too. Old right? people and young people, and not even together. It's great. Um, beautiful little girl, young woman. I think she's 15 now. I think she might be 15 or just turned 16. Her dad's been bringing her to our events since she was 14 years old, her and her older sister. And this little girl loves, she's, she just loves recoil. She, she hits it. AKs, no problem. Run it. Shotgun, okay, I'll take it. And she just sits a pretty little girl, braces, big eyes, everything. And then next to her, we'll have a 70s, 80s, 90-year-old lady. We had some awesome women come from New York City that all knew each other through urban farming. Because, again, once you start stepping into the self-sufficiency world, 
these things start inter interlocking these circles of friends and they were into urban farming and somebody said well how are you going to protect your stuff well one of their friends said hey i go to tony simon's diversity shoot you want to come check it out and now i have this whole group of women mature uh, black and hispanic women that are in the urban farming that have brought their friends from new york city and even some from philadelphia to our diversity shoots to be introduced to firearms and you don't have to become a gun nut we just introduce you and you can choose how how deep you want to stick your toe into those waters but we do it in a fun way and we make sure that no one's overbearing with cold dead hands rhetoric or some silliness like that because a lot of people aren't ready for that reality that the purpose of the second amendment is for citizens to own weapons of war i say it i say it but i don't pound it into their heads but i give them some idea of where we're coming from without turning it into a uh bumper sticker uh rally cry but it is but it isn't <laughs> you know what i mean no i totally know like you don't have to say hey look you need to pledge to these tenants before you can participate you're just like hey if you want to participate let's join you know here's how here's how to be safe here's what was going to happen here's some fun here's some pizza and, yeah, and here's i'm just gonna I'm throw going in there that i don't know if you bring this up enough but i don't know if you think right. about it enough but uh we have a bunch of people that are pro-gun all the time, right? And then they got a bunch of people on the other side that are anti-rights all the time. Like, all, they just hate guns. They hate us. They hate our concept that we would own these guns so casually. They see them as deadly items. And we're never going to change their mind. And we can either deal with that or we can, you know, can challenge ourselves to attempt to change their mind. But there's all those people in the middle. And a bunch of those people in the middle, There's, you know, most of the people are in the middle. So that's a lot of different people. But... uh there's going to be people that like guns or whatever that don't even care about rights. You know, there's all this mix of people, mm -hmm. but what we don't think about and what you, you create a bridge to and a tunnel to, because it's not a one way, like you're not broadcasting a message to these people that they're either accepting or not. you literally have a two way street. Like you have this, this continual um, experience, this continual event that people can count on. And like you just described, bring other people to, but these aren't people that are required to be gun people. You mentioned it, but I think that's a big facet. These are people that are just doing whatever. So like you said, there's the kid and the old guy and this person and that person all doing whatever at the range. But what are they doing the day after? This range happens once or twice a month and they don't necessarily attend every one. So what are they doing with the other 360 days of their lives? They're going whatever they're doing. They're gardening, they're going to the store, they're doing whatever they're doing. But because they've experienced what you, the, sec, the 2A for E does, they understand what firearms are and understand a slice of firearms ownership and our rights. So they are now an ambassador and a willing ambassador. It's not like you've infected them or put a virus on them. You've just simply opened their eyes. You've created awareness and given them an experience that now they can take with authenticity to everything else they do in the world. And they're not just gun people. You know, I, if I, a gun person, walk into some place, I mean, I try not to be a gun person, but I'm going to be comfortable around a gun. I'm not going to win, so I'm not going to get weird i'm not going to start to sweat if there's a gun in a room right so i'm going to be known as a gun person i suspect you know i'm not going to fake any of that shit either so you know what i mean like but a person who would first reaction wins when a gun comes out and then can go oh it's just a gun you know that's a i can't you know me being comfortable around a gun a thousand times isn't going to convince someone who's had a traumatic event that guns aren't the issue the traumatic event was the thing and the guns were just part of it whatever the you know needs to be done but uh, to understand that, but that person who goes, oh yeah, I wince too, but those are just guns. Don't worry about it, honey. Like, let's keep moving, right? Like that's something that you're creating all the time over the years that it's immeasurable. You can't count that, but that's moving that Overton window. That's moving the perception. That's moving, that's challenging the, the engineered perception that guns are bad. Guns are only for violence, only reckless or delusional or weird people would want a gun. And that's a t difficult thing to say, hey, we're not weird or delusional. Come join, enjoy guns, especially when, like you say, it's either you got to agree with all this, you know, even if it's not like other stuff, you know, like immigration or abortion or something like that. But it's like, you know, all guns are for the defense of the country. All guns are the defense of the self. Bullshit. 
Like guns can just be fun. Guns can be cool. You're allowed to just own a gun because you confused me about a gun one day. Who cares why you own a gun? It's your, your, your business. You'll be asked you why you bought a coffee cup or that dog or a kid. Nobody asks you about anything else. But guns, all of a sudden, they're trying to create this connotation and you're battling that. And like I said, there's there's other groups out there that that flame the or flame no fuel the flame of all the bullshit rhetoric on our side, which is fine. You know, we need that. But we have already seen what happens when you just blindly encourage that. You get hollow organizations that take advantage of the dumbass people that are gonna blindly throw thirty bucks at stuff. One hundred percent and and <sighs> All right, I'll go ahead and say it because we're here and and we're a small group of people and you guys have listened. It gets frustrating sometimes when you actually do work to and you see that I have this diverse group of people that not only have come here, but come back here and brought their family, which means something. Like the bravest dog in in, in the social circle can go by themselves and they go, I'm gonna be all right. But when they show up with their mother and their kids, that means you connected with them in a way that they felt safe enough to bring their loved ones to your event. And it was important enough to bring them, right? Like, oh, this isn't yeah. my hobby where I bake cookies differently or, you know, make a different kind of soup. This is something that's important. You're coming with me. Yeah, you're coming with me. And this is what I've been telling you. And this is the guy I told you about. And it's really great. And then you see someone who starts to go nuts for these uh like you said money making 2a advocacy i'll say it kind of snottily but you don't see them actually do work like what what do you do where do you go what have you done to ask for all this loot when tony is doing this on a pizza budget and you see the pictures from my events you know what i mean you see how many people are affected I'm like, pay attention to that. Advocacy, and I, and I do believe people that donate to these Second Amendment organizations support advocacy, but watch where your money goes and, and see what work that you can physically see them do. That's I don't get boring people. If you've, never, if you've only ever experienced hostess cupcakes and grandma's never, you know, you never had a grandma that, you know, you never had access to a grandma. Not everybody has grandmas, right? But if you never had access to a grandma cooking cupcakes, like like a grandma would from flour and oil and whatever out make cupcakes out of, you know what I mean? Like you're never going to understand the difference or, you know, fill in the blank with a nice bakery, I guess. But, you know, really it's the love or whatever. It's the grandma that makes 12 of them for the, you know, six kids or whatever or whatever. You know what I mean? It's not the, oh, I went to the store and bought a dozen out of the 78 they made that day. Yeah. I mean, it's true. Well, I guess I was so saying that, you know, if you've only ever had the, the, if you've only ever seen, I have to insert $30 here and advocacy, advocacy comes out the other end as a receipt. You know, like if you're doing an exchange with a robot, if people have never seen actual work getting done, then, you know what I mean? They don't know maybe that there's an alternative. They don't know that mm-hmm. you can take that 30 bucks and divide it into two fifteen dollar donations and mm-hmm. give one to each help out help out i'm never gonna say and I, let's just go ahead i'm talking about the nra um nra does a lot of stuff nra has dropped the ball in my opinion on really laying it out there with wayne lapierre and how much they actually do so people have made decisions so i'm not going to say hey you should support the nra blindly but if you have some questions, you can support local Second Amendment advocacy organizations that do work you can see. Now, of course, I support CNJFO in New Jersey, um, ANJRPC in New Jersey, and NJ2AS. All these people I know, I've been to their events, I supported their events. The president and the people on the board are friends of mine, so I know they do the work. You can do the same thing in your area. Maj Torre with Black Guns Matter. I've been to his events in Philly. Uh, he does real work. He's sitting in a room full of people that probably never thought they'd be sitting in a gun range before. 
a lot of people from inner city Philadelphia, and they're learning about the four rules of gun safety for the first time. And they have questions, and some of the questions may seem dumb, but understand they've never had a formal class, even if they have had guns before. Some of the dudes may have a criminal record or have a criminal record, but they've never been convicted. So they can legally buy a gun, but they don't know anything about it. And they've gotten out of their lifestyle and they're in their thirties, forties, and they want to be able to protect their family because they see what's happening. Well, we don't need more obstacles in their way besides the fees and the cultural crap that they've dealt with the whole time that only a thug will have a gun. So he's reaching those people and within that circle of reaching those people that may not be somebody who ever voted against the party that's pushing for gun control, he plants a seed. He plants a seed in their head about this is about self-sufficiency and protecting your family. And this is a civil right. And why would you support someone who's taking your civil rights away and trying to tell you they're keeping you safe when you're here because you know you're not safe and the government's failing to keep you safe? Our goal can't be to flip somebody overnight. Our goal is to plant seeds, put it out there, let them see where we're coming from. And that takes time and that takes funding. So when I say, please support your local, you could go if you live in New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And truthfully, Mods used to tour across the country. I don't know if he's starting that up again. But support someone who's doing work like that, things you can go and see. Don't just blindly trust that somehow 100% of your donation or your yearly membership is going to fight the good fight. I fight fights differently. My, my fight is on a personal level. It's grassroots and it's talking to people. Maj does the same thing. Uh, Fires Policy Coalition does something totally different. Your local 2A, Nebraska Firearms Owners Association, those guys, Trish, uh, John, DJ Play Nice, all those guys put in work in Nebraska fighting and educating people on the legislation and things that are coming out of Nebraska, which most people somehow see as a free state and they don't understand your freedoms are always under attack. So even right. if you live in a good state, a free state, participate in two way advocacy. They're even able to do that despite that they have a panhandle. What? They're one of the panhandle afflicted states. Oh, really? States that identify with a panhandle. I don't know how they'd like to be called, but yeah, they're a panhandle state. <laughs> yeah, so uh, another thing, um, you can join a lot of these groups like Nebraska Fire Owners Association without having to pay a fee. You just get on their mailing list and you are considered a member. And that also helps them when they talk about their numbers when when they speak in the capital when when they talk about how many members they represent they don't all have to be from nebraska and then that helps them out and you spent zero dollars you get another email which may uh, make you aware of what other states are going through and also again like i said you'll learn that your rights are always under attack even if you live in a good state when it comes to firearms Please understand, this is a national fight. I did not watch the State of the, of the Union address, but I've seen enough stuff from others that says he's trying to push an assault weapons ban again. I'm assuming, again, I didn't watch anything and I haven't even heard it. I just saw something someone wrote as I was blowing through IG. Uh, because again, I've been working overtime every day this week. So I haven't had time to be on. This fight never stops. You don't have to be in it 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years on end. But understand this fight is going on without you and we need your help. And that's why I've come on these shows to be heard. To just to, to spew this message, to give this information I'm giving now and to try to connect with people who are gun owners like a lot of you guys here. And a lot of you guys do stuff. You, you've introduced people to firearms. You ladies have introduced people to firearms on your own. 
and there's people like me out there that are doing it on another level with strangers and depending on those strangers to bring in their friends and family and it's working it's working but we need your support that's why i asked for it uh diversityshoot.com if you want to donate also that's why maj asked for it over at black guns matter because we need this this is not free that's why uh wow why did <laughs> i was gonna say why did that blank out on derek derek leblanc's name for kids say foundation and obviously i didn't blank out at all but <laughs> derek introduces children to guns in a school setting and, and to safe to firearm safety and he uses that as a gateway again it's all about introducing this is how firearms used to be it's an american a very American pastime, a very American thing. But they've been working real hard over the last three generations to make firearms ownership some weird thing. This has only been going on since, what, 34? 1934, they've been trying to demonize the firearm on a national level as a movement? I don't know. It's to be interesting. I've heard some, I've seen when I've investigated that I've found some reference to 1934 but i'm not aware of any at least like nothing comes to my mind that's a specific investigation into why 1934 happened um i saw a ken burns documentary right if you're familiar with those um he did a three-part documentary on the pro prohibition and it essentially describes what happened they create they did prohibition on alcohol that created organized crime organized crime escalated fighting with each other and that in order to say oh it wasn't you know to divert from the political situation that created the problem they blamed the gun so you know it played into the overall socialism i don't know if it was called socialism in the 30s it might have been raw socialism i don't remember when all these things i'm not a what's that called like a political historian or whatever or uh, researcher but, you know, I don't know what it was technically called, but you're right. Like something had to be like, oh, we need a scapegoat from why all this crime is happening. Oh, you know what? If we blame guns, we get to disarm everybody. So something did happen in 34. And then it was edited slightly in 38 with the FFLs. And then nothing happened again until 68, essentially. Right. There was the Miller and whatever. But, you know, except from the Miller and the FFLs, it was like two instances all the way 30 years later. So we know what happened in the 60s then it was communists communists lost the cold war so they decided to mess with us in lots of different ways getting into politics and schools and culture and stuff you know whether or not people want to believe that their ideology did you know whether or not there was a person orchestrating it the ideology existed and they said oh well all these other socialist countries were pretty good except that they just didn't do it perfectly so we're going to turn this democracy into socialism and we'll do it perfectly Right. So that's that that concept got in. And that's where I believe most of the gun control comes from, because they need a scapegoat from all the failed things. You know, oh, people aren't behaving properly. It can't be our policy. It can't be our utopian state run, you know, state dictated theories of everything. So instead, it must be the, the, the let's call it the gun. And plus, we need to get rid of guns because these people are you know consistently or continually trying to be individuals and this gun is one of the you know most symbolic things of individualism except for the car but they're not attacking the car and that they wouldn't go after the car would they there's no way they're going to go after the car or our ability to drive around or anything that's silly so hmm. you know, i'm ranting but yeah i, I would be no, curious I, I i really would like to see something that research somebody knows what they're doing like research 1934 and figure out why we got the 34 nfa but sorry, I went on a tangent. You're right. Like since 34, though, is when they started messing with it. Yeah, because again, I don't think it started in 34. I think 34 was when it got that, they got that win. Uh, I believe it went back further. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about was Red Summer 1919, 1920, when blacks across America, multiple cities were attacked and had actual towns burned down. And they, I, this is just me when I'm tracking back on, you know, firearms and gun control and the racist uh, foundations of gun control. Well, you can't intimidate somebody as easily uh, if they have a shotgun and able to shoot at your butt when you're trying to burn that cross in their front yard. And I think that was another one of the ways they got around 
because they passed weird gun laws before, like um, uh, after in between after the Civil War, you could purchase a whole bunch of surplus firearms cheaply, and you didn't have to go through FFLs. It was just they were in the general store, or they were surplus, and somebody bought a big ass crate of them, and that was in the store or different stores, and they were able to blacks and other people were able to protect themselves, including Native Americans. Well, I don't know if Native Americans could buy one in a general store, but understand Italian Americans were targeted and Asian Americans were targeted and they were passing gun control laws to make it difficult for these people to legally buy these inexpensive guns to protect themselves. And I think when prohibition came along and they were taking this big L on prohibition because of the rise in crime rates, Again, government created the problem. Government said they could fix the problem if they could just have a few of your rights. And that really, that recipe hasn't changed yet. Government created gun-free zones. 96% of mass shootings since 1950 has happened in gun-free zones. Just give us some more of your rights and we can stop these massacres from happening in gun-free zones by passing more restrictions on you being able to carry in a gun-free zone. So yeah, the formula stays the same. I just wonder, like, it all added up. Again, what I tell people is we're all in this together. They might have used it. They might have used gun control to control Black people and disarm Black people, but that was the beta test. They, they got it down to a science now. They're telling you things like, hey, to keep you safer. And many, 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 many people are believing it. That if the government has the only access to firearms, you'll be safer. Even though the government has access to firearms, laws, and all the funding your tax dollars can pay for, and they still can't stop crime. How are you giving up your ability to defend yourself? There's a couple of things here, but uh, when you say they want to have the monopoly on force, that's another way to say, you know, they want to have all the guns. Mm -hmm. They don't say, and we're going to go through the criminals and grab all their guns first. And once the criminals are disarmed, now you can feel comfortable to take your guns. Why is it that they want to have the monopoly on force and they'll say, peaceful law abiding folks, give us your guns first, then it'll be easier for us to go get the criminals guns. Like, how does that help? You know, why aren't you getting the criminals guns first to show us? We don't need them. So there's that reply to that concept of, you know, only the police should have guns. And if only the police, because I can understand the logic. If you really think only the police should have guns and somehow that's going to happen, like only the police should have fire trucks or something. So, you know, no, no regular people aren't going to have fire trucks and therefore there won't be fires. Okay, fine. If that's your logic, then when are you going to go get all those guns from the criminals? Like, how come you don't go do that now? Or why don't you go do that first or apply that? So that the people who say, I need my guns to defend myself from the bad criminals, they don't have to defend themselves anymore. And they'll let, easily give up their guns. So it's just like, okay, let's use your logic. If you get rid, get rid of all guns from society, we'll be more peaceful. So go get the guns from the people that aren't peaceful first. Why does it have to be from the people who are peaceful first, who have a con only concern is the government having only guns and the criminals have guns. Like, they, seriously. So th I think there's that logic we can throw at them, even if they won't accept our logic. I was going to throw something else on top of your other points, though. I didn't know when to stop because I didn't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to throw another layer on there just because I've been focusing on this quite a bit lately. But the mm -hmm. government, whether or not you want to, however you want to look at it, but typically people that hate our rights and hate gun ownership, right? They're also going to hate international wars and any kind of political stuff that involves uh, uh, violence, right? So the government who has exclusive determination on where we use ultimate violence and we send people, we, we recruit people, we pay them good money and train them. We pick only the best of the people to do it, to give the train them to go do violence, right? And the government is the one who determines that violence. It's either a senator or um, typically a senator is the only one that has that kind of power to influence where we're, the executive branch is going to point something but the executive branch eventually points violence somewhere. 
And that happens with human beings, right? Com uh, some equipment as well, but the human beings that either maintain or monitor or hold that equipment in their hands while the violence is happening, uh, you either consider that those people inhuman or you accept that the government has some responsibility in either that happening or potentially, and most people I think would have compassion enough to say what happens to those people after the fact. And since they want us, the people who hate our rights and hate the property, right, are going to say that there's gun deaths. Well, we know that they can't be talking about crime because there's just not that much crime. We're a fairly peaceful country as far as crime. Uh, we know that the crime all happens typically gang on gang. So it's typically in black markets fighting over turf or some other ridiculous thing that could be avoided through better policy. Um, but instead, uh, the, the gun deaths come from suicide. And what we're talking about here is suicide of veterans for the most part or EMS or police. Right. It's typically those lines of work that deal with people who ultimately devote their lives and put their literally put their lives at risk so that they can help others or help others from having to deal with violence and or, you know, anything carnage if we're talking AMS or something. But um, and then we either casually dismiss those people with either situations that are physically happen from in, uh, having uh, stress to the body concussions and other traumatic situations but high stress situations we now know over study that that creates massive massive chemical dumps dumps into the body and that can affect your life in the future with your hormones and your your blood and all kinds of stuff like people are uh, susceptible to all kinds of physical harm and we know that we take that for I mean, we know that they're bad backs and their knees and stuff from carrying around heavy equipment or just repetitive stress injuries you know we know that that's not just the tip of the spear. We're talking like everybody involved in every aspect of important emergency work that gets done from the person that stresses out to make sure the equipment is ready at a moment's notice to the people that are repairing the equipment so that it can be ready at a moment's notice. I mean, we often overlook all the people that make sure that the couple of people that have the worst of the brunt of it, you know, that are trained to the most level, you know, are supported by dozens and thousands of other people. And all of these people are living at levels of stress that in their older years develop into issues that ultimately, unfortunately, I don't want to say occasionally anymore because it's up to 22 a day result in the decision to commit suicide. And that, I believe, we're leaving on the table and not holding either the government culpable or those fucking assholes that take all this for granted. They're standing on these deaths and they're suggesting that law-abiding gun owners are somehow responsible when we're the only ones that actually give a shit about what's happening here and are actually doing multiple like just tons of things dj will drop links to lots of stuff that's happening to try to affect that situation but the situation is that people have ultimate care for other people and give their life or have ultimate few options and give their life to that uh occupation or those kind of occupations that are selfless but also take a lot from a person physically emotionally and whatever else and think about the families like how you know how what's the divorce rate for these kind of occupations and people will casually laugh at that or make jokes but that's because they are trying to cope with it right but how do you age with your physical situations with then having emotional issues with your family so Fuck all them for suggesting that guns are somehow the scapegoat for all this when it's their political decisions and their policies, their failed policies that create the situation that they're then going to use against us. Once we figure out how to enunciate that better and more often, thanks to people like Brooke Cheney, uh, Walk Talk America and others that are, you know, making that possible. Anyway, I'll shut up. But I wanted to add that layer that, you know, in addition to them, uh, like you said, uh, using well, the stuff that we've often talked about, I just want to start adding that layer to it, that they create the situation that causes the suicides, and then they use the deaths from suicides against gun owners. I hope that came out all right, not just a rant. <laughs> it 100% came out all right, because it's freaking true. And uh, sitting with these people, being friends with the people that runs uh, these organizations and things, you see the work they do that goes unnoticed. I mean, who's been, I mean, finally, 
hold or walk, talk, or not walk, talk. Hold my guns got in a national magazine, right? By, I forgot the publication she was just publishing finally. But it's like, she's been doing work for years. I've, I've been friends with Sarah for years and she's put in the work, but hasn't gotten the recognition. But every time you turn around, one of these anti-gun organizations is able to spew their lies uh, and slanted numbers and never have to take responsibility that they don't do anything to lower the numbers of gun deaths. They used to call themselves a gun safety organization, and we kept checking them on that till the fact they stopped using it because they, they can't even show where they shown anyone how to safely use a firearm. You're not a gun safety organization if the only lesson you have is abstinence. Correct. Well, they they you, you can't use abstinence as a as an educational op- option for sex, but you have mm-hmm. to use it for firearms because it won't That's work for way. sex. It's, a, it's harmful to the children if you do it for sex. If you suggest abstinence for sex, and I don't I think I'm quoting at least what they told us when I was a little kid that you can't you have to teach kids about it otherwise they're going to be curious and they're going to do stuff guns oh no you have well back in our day they bring guns into school because of that same concept they were consistent across the board you got to give let kids be curious so that they can know what's important like, just like you would with a stove or the keys to the car or anything else is dangerous but um anyway I'm going off on a tangent <laughs> but it's 100% true it's like can't, can't you just keep your message consistent how is it so difficult for you and it's because it's not a real match, it's a political movement. And when you get politics involved, it doesn't have to make sense. Politics aren't like, politics is just manipulation. What I'm trying to do is get you to recognize that you're the only first responder. The founding fathers were 100% right. The government can't be trusted. And, um, it's up to us to turn gun control into political suicide. We're the only ones that can do it. And it has to be across the board. There can't be any gatekeeping because once we start gatekeeping, once we start cutting people out, well, that's what they, the people that want to steal your rights, will use against us. Oh, you're anti fill in the blank of whatever they want you to fill in the blank with, whoever the people you told they can't show up and participate in this human right. You're anti them. But somehow, the anti gun movement is not anti them when you want to disarm these people and leave them at the mercy of any violent criminal. Just say. There is no consistency because it's a political movement. It doesn't have to make sense. Wrong button. Um. We're hour and 47. I don't want to keep Tony all day. And Brooke is coming up in a couple of hours. Hillbilly's got a show after that. And then DM Foss has an overnight show. Uh, do you listen to anything on Saturdays? Or are you on any other shows on Saturdays? Well, hold on. Used to be you would be on this show after Play Society. Man, this thing will not come off a of mute when I want it to. I'm over here tapping this like I'm sending a Morse code. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't listen to anything on Saturday. This Saturday, hopefully when I get off here, I'll pull my head out of my butt and record the latest of the 2A40 podcast to put it out. That's the plan. Um, the... I think 10 segments I've already done that never became a show. I think I'm going to put those out for uh, patrons. Oh, right on. Mainly because the time has gone by. Yeah, the time has gone by. This is no longer, you know, some of the things I said six, eight months ago are no longer relevant. But I have been said they were on the show. I just never put the show out. So let's get it out there. (laughs) It sucks being human sometimes. Because I want my show to be perfect, and and perfect is the enemy of good enough. Is that how to say that? Mm, Yeah, I think so. 
At least that's how I remember it. I think that was, uh, what do you call him? Rock, uh, com- communist. That was uh, Kalashnikov. Same, basically oh, same. Really? I'm pretty sure that was Kalashnikov saying, or at least he used that motto, so maybe somebody else came up with it way before him, but that was his sort of idea for his inventions. Yeah, because I want my shows to be great. I want it to have the same segments over and over again. But, and the, usually my hangout is legislation because I hate it. You know, the anti-gun legislation, because I have to tell you the lies that are being told. I have to research it. And then I get angry about it as I'm researching it and don't want to talk about it anymore. The other day, I was like, you know what, I'm going to go through and just I tick a list, you know, list of the states, you know, whatever comes out of Alabama through probably Wyoming or something down there. And I was just going to go into Google or search engine or whatever. And actually, I was going to take three, I had three search engines open on one screen, this uh, document open. And I was going, I was de- debating whether I would do it live. And I figured, no, nah, it might end up taking too long. So I'm not going to go live because it would just take even longer. Whenever you go live, you know, you're distracted and talking and, you know, you know, so I'm like, I'm just going to try doing this project. And I opened up three search engines, typed in Alabama gun laws, because I think that was the first state alphabetically. Uh, nothing really going on. There was something, but I typed it in, you know, I put it in there, kind of debated whether to put it in there, typed in the next one, the next one by about five states. You know, there was a couple of things going on. I learned about Arizona. I didn't realize that here in Arizona, we had a anti-gun bill go through that I didn't even hear about. Um, But now we have uh, a bullshit anti-gun bill as bad as uh, Michigan. So um, anyway, I kept going and uh, with as much, ambition as I had to do it and as much interest in I had in doing it, I could only get through, I didn't even get to the whatever's after A. Like I, I was still, I think in the A's and it was just so tedious and it took like two hours or something uh, to kind of, maybe I got through them in the A's, but essentially I was never going to get through all 50 states. It would have taken forever. So one of the ways they are going to get us and they have in the past and they will, as it gets easier and more difficult for us, it's going to get easier and more difficult for them to split up. You know, they used to have one big organization. They would kind of change the name of it. And then there was two and then there was like three for whatever strategic reasons or whatever logistic reasons, whatever. But now whenever they need to, they're going to be able to drop to 75 organizations or 750. And I don't even think we're used to dealing with one or two. So, you know, it's, it's going to be new challenges going forward consistently. There's just money to be made here. There's freedom at risk. So, those are in it for the long haul. You know, it's not going to be the same fight next year. It's not going to be the same fight two years from now. It's still going to be a fight, though, unfortunately. Well, I want to say it. it's going to be a fight. It's always going to be a conversation um, to be had in front of a bunch of those 80 people in the middle or 80% of people in the middle. And I think our fate comes from how well we handle that conversation, how often we have that conversation, how effective we are in that conversation. I 100% agree with you. I think one of the things we need to do is understand we can't gatekeep because that 75 groups, that 750 groups is not going to come from, every one of them isn't going to come from someone that looks like you and thinks like you. It has to come from people all along the political spectrum. And every, uh, again, every other checkbox they try to divide Americans into has to be along all of those because that's how you fight it. You have way too many heads on the hydra. You have way too many people that you can't just say they're racist. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't say they hate women. It's like it just takes that voice away when you realize it's a human right. And you can't attack me. There is no moral superiority in the trying to act as if somehow something's wrong with me because I want an efficient tool to protect me and my family. Or how's this? It's my freaking right. I don't have to tell you why I'm doing it. Matter of fact, I don't even have a reason. I don't even have to have a good reason, in your opinion, to own a gun because it's my freaking right. Somebody will watch somebody pull up to Walmart in a pickup truck and come out of Walmart with literally a pallet, like have, you know, beep, beep, beep. And they bring out a forklift and throw a pallet of, I mean, fill in the blank. You could be Jack Daniels on there, it could be uh, rat poison. Uh, could be starter fluid from the automotive department. Who's ever going to bat an eye? You know, you buy a rifle and there's this connotation.
we got media. There's a lot of stuff working against us, but uh, like you say, we've got a bunch of. There, it's really difficult for them to say anything anymore. When the only way they can say anything is to ignore a bunch of reality and say, like you say, that we're whatever associated with violence in any way. Like there's just too much uh, opposite of that out there. When the fastest growing demographic of firearms ownership are women, and the fastest growing in that demographic are women of color, kind of hard to keep shouting that it's middle-aged white men that are the problem that own firearms, but still attack the firearm. You use the person to attack the firearm. Stop it. You're going to lose. You're going to lose if we keep doing this the right way and being as inclusive as possible with this human right. Um, sadly, and I only went by this because I don't watch the news, but we have a television in the lunchroom at work. And I saw something that broke down the concerns of the American voter. And it was like 4% of their interest was guns. Like it was only 4%. Yeah, yeah, I saw that too, where they were asking like the political issues or whatever for the election. And it was like yeah, whatever, what was immigration important? and the economy and the wars. And yeah, guns were like 4%. I thought that was good though. I don't know. You thought that was bad, discouraging? I thought it was discouraging because, <laughs> well, a lot of the things that got people interested in the other things, the economy, being able to keep what they own, being able to stop, you know, mostly peaceful protests happening. Uh, the crime that's coming with the increase of, you know, the border issue, all of that can, like, you know, one of the things you use to solve that problem is firearms ownership. But they've pushed it all the way to the bottom of 4% when it's like, you know, all that stuff went sideways. But this thing right here may protect you from all that stuff for a little while. Oh, shit, I never thought about that way, dude. Yeah. No, that's 100% yeah, correct. No one's going to protect you from all of that. Yeah, no one's going to protect you. No one party's going to fix all of these other things you talked about. But you having the ability personally to protect you from the out outcome or the results of their failed policies on all that other stuff is this little 4% thing right here. That's I want to pull the thing out again because I always, like, you know, when I... I think of the person who doesn't want to own a gun, right? And who doesn't want to be in a conflict. And they got all the right in the world to not want to be in a conflict and not want to own a gun. Like I'm 100% down with that as a decision in a free country, go for it. Now, we differ typically that person and I because they can't just chill out and deal with the fact that their neighbor has guns. They somehow are going to strap onto their neighbor some kind of, you know, you might flip out or any kind of trip they've got, they're going to throw on their neighbor. So what you're talking about there, I think, to kind of zoom out, when if you can at least, you don't even have to ever consider owning a gun. You don't have to fathom ever owning a gun, but you have to only consider the, what's the word, the deterrent factor that if your neighbor, who's a normal person and owns a lot of dangerous things, just like you do, and the people across the street own dangerous things, and guess what? Criminals own dangerous things right now. Criminals out walking around. Oh, no, they should be in jail. Guess what? They're not. And they're walking around with dangerous things. But guess what? Everybody's still, you know, the moon's still going around the earth. The tides still happen. You know, dogs still want to be fed twice a day. Like, you know, things still happen. But if you can just chill out and understand that if your neighbor has the ability to own a gun, doesn't even have to own a gun, just has to have the ability to own a gun. There's a deterrent factor there where bad people go, when there's a lethal consequence to my actions, I'm going to do something peaceful. And they they won't understand that there's that deterrence factor. And I don't like to say, oh, there's a million situations each year and those crimes are deterred by gun ownership that may or may not be true but a lot of times it's just because the person who owns the gun is confident enough in their abilities to walk confidently through a parking lot and deter that bad person from preying on them and that's in, in, you can't count that how many times that happens right but you can see a parking lot full of people who are unarmed because there's a gun-free zone and the bad people who want to can just go out and 
intimidate. They don't even have to have guns. They can just intimidate people because they know their victim is unarmed. And when you live in that kind of world, you're scared and you assume everyone is out to get you and everyone is violent. And that's unfortunate because in the rest of the world where predators understand there's a lethal consequence for actions, they aren't predators. They go do something else. Maybe they just, you know, work at a video store or something, but, you know, they, they don't pursue the life of intimidating people. So I think that deterrence factor is often overlooked that you're, 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 it's like when they say guns in schools, they jump immediately to the binary. Now there's teachers sloppily leaving guns around, teachers getting angry and shooting students out of a whim, which is ridiculous and buffoonish. And they would be offended if someone suggested the same with their teaching or some other aspect of teaching, right? So, uh, you know, if we get, get them to just realize that if you not have a problem with your neighbor owning a gun, then that there is a deterrence factor. I'm repeating myself now. So I just wanted to throw that on there that because there's people that are just never going to own a gun and they just can't handle the concept of self-determination and they shouldn't have to, you know, it's not on them. It's not in the constitution that you have to pursue happiness, but you're not allowed to stop somebody else from pursuing happiness just because you're scared to, or you don't want to, you choose not to. I'm preaching again. We're at the two hours. Um, you talked about the diversity shoot, but did you say when the next one is? We're going to get the website set up or whatever. Um, we can do that right after the show here if you want. But um, if you want to let just let people know for the podcast side, I see Mario's out there. Welcome. Give me a second. Let me pull it up. <clears throat> here we go. Nailed it. April 11th. Gun for Higher Range in Woodland Park. That's going to be the next diversity shoot. Um. Again, I have all the dates for Gun for Hire for the entire year. I'm working to make sure we have the dates, uh, the dates for other places uh, because we're changing up a little bit and it's great. Also, we're working toward finding another ammo sponsor for 2024. So that's, I can't wait for that. Um, matter of fact, I'm looking forward to who or even if we're going to have multiple ammo sponsors, which is great. Plus, you yourself can donate to 2A4E uh, ammo. You can either send it uh, to, like, Gun for Higher Range and have them put a letter on it saying this is for Tony Simon's diversity shoots. Or you can purchase it from Gun for Higher Range and say this is for Tony Simon's diversity shoots. I'm going to be there again on April 11th, 6 p.m. to 8.30. We usually do 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. But their guys get off at 9, and we usually clean the room up for them. And, and try to leave the room spotless, but I guess this year they want us out here early so they can clean the room themselves. So that's what we're doing, diversityshoot.com. You'll be able to find it. Also follow me on Simon Says Train on Instagram. Simon Says Train on Facebook. Second is for any everyone on Facebook. Second, the number two. Second, four, the number four, everyone on twitter go that way you can uh follow me on twitter i like posting stuff there i don't know if you know a guy named spike cohen i don't know what spike cohen does but spike cohen has a lot of followers and last week he reposted one of my tweets and i picked up darn near 300 followers in the next four days so uh thank you mr spike cohen <laughs> for reposting uh one of my tweets and it helped us grow, and I think that's really cool. Hopefully, it, it develops into people inviting me to other states and motivating others to do their own advocacy, however they have to find their way. Again, if you want to donate, go to diversityshoot.com. DJ Play Nice has the link in the bio. And also, you can follow me and listen to our podcast on the Gun and Gear Review podcast. That's on the Gun and Gear Review podcast channel on YouTube or wherever you download your podcast apps. You know, I looked it up because we've spoken about this and the podcasts that I named are all in the top 1% of podcasts in the world. Yeah. That's, That's insane. Cool. And the two, and two, eight, four, e podcast is in the top 5% using the metrics that uh, I just did. That's also another reason I want to start putting out more shows. I have more people listening, more people uh, follow me now than when I first started the thing. And uh, I think 
as a friend of mine said, I, I put out a lot of common sense stuff that you don't find in the gun world for somebody that does what I do. I, I don't just sit on my butt. I also compete in different disciplines of firearms from rifle shooting to action pistol to shooting 22s to military arms competitions. I compete. I want to hunt eventually. That's something I definitely want to get into just for the aspect of the firearms ownership and self-reliance of it. But I at least want to check it out. And I'm an activist. And I don't believe in gatekeeping. So I'm a, I think I'm a little unique only because I've started the podcast. I don't think I'm that unique. But there are not a lot of dudes that do, or ladies that do some of what I do. But I'm friends with a lot of them. But they're not really that many of us when you count in the overall how many millions of people own firearms. So that's what I talk about on our podcast. And I bring in like minded people to introduce you to that, again, might not look like me, but they're in this fight. And I have uh, some canned interviews from a lot of different people that I've taken. So I want to get that out there because I think that's important. So that's enough prattling on about what I do or where I'm at. But I really thank you all for participating and asking questions. Um, it's great. Right on. Well, thanks for joining us again this week. And we'll uh, wrap it up so that we're, you know, kind of a long show. I'm not trying to do a short format podcast for sure. But um, if people would like to hear a shorter for format one, let me know. We can certainly chop these up. There's uh, AIs that will chop these into, you know, pieces per subject type of thing uh, but uh, I'm not going to spend that time or cost probably to uh, do it just for no reason we're not trying to necessarily uh, do much here other than get together and keep a live conversation going and uh, keep up to date on uh, what's happening in each other's uh, um, realm I guess and then answer questions along the way so uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And if you've got questions, like the uh, intro says, just go to askgunquestions.com, throw it in there, and uh, we may not be super fast about answering them, but we eventually do answer all of them over there. And uh, thanks to the people that join us live, because uh, it might be sloppy compared to some kind of scripted pr pr presentation out there, but uh, I, be, I do appreciate the, uh, the interaction. So thanks to everybody that was joining us live. And if you're joining us as a podcast, like Tony said, uh, it's crazy how many people listen. Um, the last time I checked, we were in the top 10% of all podcasts, and I had no idea we were that high, so that's why I started paying more attention to it. Uh, I'll go see if uh, we're moving at all in the rankings, but yeah, it's super cool. And again, I've noticed that a lot of people are um, listening again now that it's happening on the regular and more consistently across the channel. So leave us some feedback out there. We're not so large that we're not reading all that feedback, and we'll definitely incorporate it into the shows. Uh, I think I'll throw a commercial up here for the end, and then uh, Tony's got time. We'll just chat off air here for a bit. Yeah, first, thanks, everyone. Gearwebsites.com is your source for firearms-based playing cards and books. We also have mugs, shirts, and posters with designs that we've made live. Of course, we have patches. Every Friday is Free Patch Friday. We appreciate your support. Thank you for shopping at Gearwebsites.com. And then I'll throw a link out here to Brooks' show. I'll send you over there after. <laughs>